Hello and welcome back for our webinar on neuroanatomy. The last episode of neuroanatomy and that episode number is six. My dear students, we have almost finished the study of whole brain so far, but uh, we have uh, some miscellaneous parts about brain which are yet to be studied, including the spinal cord. The central nervous system consists of brain and spinal cord. We have studied brain, we will study spinal cord and all the miscellaneous part which is related to brain like you know, cranial nerves, uh, the blood supply of the brain that is circle of beliefs and the venous drainage of the brain that is uh, dural sinuses, the meninges of the brain, that coding of the brains and uh, what we call the CSF, circulation of CSF, ventricular system, that we will study today. So today we will finish the whole neuroanatomy as such. So I welcome you all for the last episode on neuroanatomy. And my dear students, uh, I hope that you remember the forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain and different um, six major parts of the brain. And because, because, of, uh, because without that we cannot proceed further, that's why. So here at the outset, let me tell you that four brain consists of telencephalon and diencephalon, which together make a prosencephalon. Prosencephalon means four brain. Mesencephalon means midbrain. And rhombencephalon means hindbrain, which includes the pons, medulla oblongata, and cerebellum. But pons and cerebellum together they are called as metencephalon. And Middle oblongata is called as myelencephalon. You can see there is a ventricular system in, inside the brain which consists of four ventricles. Two lateral ventricles are present in the cerebral hemisphere and third ventricle is present in the diencephalon. So all, you know, uh, three ventricles, all, you know, three ventricles, they are present in the four brain. So in midbrain, there is no ventricle, but there is an aqueduct, duct, which is called as cerebral aqueduct. Or activated of sylvius and fourth ventricle is located in the hind brain and that is fourth ventricle so in front there is a pons and middle oblongata and behind there is a cerebellum so in between that there is a fourth ventricle and after middle oblongata there is a spinal cord so we have to study spinal cord first you can see the spinal cord uh, image here and uh, brain and spinal cord which shows you the central nervous system here you can see central nervous system will go to the spinal cord. Spinal cord is almost 18 inches in long, that means 45 centimeters, 45 centimeters. And it starts from the foramen magnum and ends at the level of upper border of the L1 vertebra. Below that, there you can see corda equina. So this spinal cord has got uh, one, two, three, four, and five types of vertebrae, okay? Seven cervical, so not spinal cord, spinal column. So spinal column has got five types of vertebrae. There's a cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, sacral vertebrae makes a sacrum, and coccygeal vertebrae make a coccyx. So corresponding to all these vertebrae, there are spinal nerves, and spinal nerves are 31 pairs, whereas total vertebrae, separate vertebrae are 33 in number, and spinal nerves are 31 in number, because there are eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, 5 lumbar spinal nerves, 5 sacral spinal nerves, and 1 pair of coccygeal spinal nerves. So altogether there are 31 pairs. Each spinal nerve has got two roots of origin and then there is a spinal nerve body which immediately divides into ventral and, uh, ventral and dorsal ramus. This we have studied in the neurology in a separate topic what we call general neurology. And you can see the distribution of these cervical nerves exact to which part of the body is given here. Okay. Well, the spinal nerves are coming out from the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramina here. You can see the spinal cord cross section here. You can see the edge shape, gray matter in the center surrounded by white matter. And all the tracts are present in the white matter, different ascending and descending tracts. And you can see the nerves, spinal nerves, formation of spinal nerves by sensory root, which always has a ganglion and a motor root without a ganglion. Okay, and spinal 
now you can see here and uh, this is the distribution of brachial plexus and sacral plexus what we saw during the general neurology the spinal nerve spinal cord has got two enlargements also because of this and spinal cord cross section shows you this h shape gray matter and white matter surrounding it afferent and inferent you know rami of the spinal nerves when they join together to form a spinal nerve and you can see the sensory root and a motor root here same thing again is shown in this diagram so these are different diagram to make you understand the spinal cord spinal cord has got an anterior median fissure here and there is a posterior median fissure there okay you can see the dorsal root of uh, spinal nerve over here the spinal nerve is also covered by the same meninges which cover the brain so in this image you can see the dura mater arachnoid mater and a pia mater okay and you can see this h shaped gray matter here in this diagram all well, different diagrams make you understand the uh, structures very nicely so i have brought this different uh, diagrams here now let us see what uh, spinal cord means okay the spinal cord is a long lower cylindrical part of cns so cns consist of brain spherical part and spinal cord cylindrical part okay so spinal cord occupies the upper two third of the vertebral canal so vertebral canal is present in the vertebral column so upper two third is occupied by the spinal cord below one third there is a spinal uh, spinal canal what is called vertebral canal but it consists of cord equina and the spinal nerves spinal cord begins at the foramina magnum in the skull that is a part of occipital bone and it terminates as conus medullaris in between the l1 and l2 vertebrae lumbar first and lumbar second vertebrae so lower border of l1 or upper border of l2 you can say the limit of spinal cord the spinal cord has got fissures we have showed those fissure anterior median fissure posterior median fissure it has also got sulci and enlargement and spinal roots which forms 31 pairs of spinal nerves enlargements for brachial plexus and sacral plexus lumbosacral plexus the spinal cord has got a h shaped gray matter in the center surrounded by the white matter so gray matter is made up of cell bodies and cell bodies of neurons and white matter is made up of axons of neurons spinal cord transmits information to and fro between the body and brain so 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 whatever comes from brain through spinal cord goes to body from body spinal cord it goes to brain so that is why it is like transmits information sensory and motor conduit and source of sensation and movement sensation means sensory functions and motor means movements and it is uh meant for execution of simple reflexes so what we have seen in reflex are the same thing and uh, my dear students we have uh, finished the cross anatomy of spinal cord and uh, now actually we have finished the central nervous system whole but i told you that there are some miscellaneous structures which are present in the central nervous system that we have to study like coverings of the brain we are begin right from the skull and the cranial nerves here in this image you can see the 12 pairs of cranial nerves you can see those in different colors and named with the you no know, blue background okay with white letters we should know the names of all 12 cranial nerves and you should always say that 12 pairs of cranial nerves not 12 or not 24 it's always 12 pairs of cranial nerves because they are same on each side so first is olfactory second is optic third is oculomotor third is oculomotor fourth is trochlear fifth is trigeminal you can see big now here trigeminal after trigeminal sixth is abducens seventh is facial eighth is vestibular cochlear and ninth is glasso pharyngeal tenth is vagus eleventh is accessory and twelfth is hypoglossal the meaning of all these names uh, nerves is there in the name itself for example olfactory is it is for the purpose of olfaction olfaction is the sensation of smell so it is for spatial sensation of smell tomorrow we are going to start study of spatial senses so we will come to that part again and again so for example vagus is called as vagus because it is a wandering nerve because it is going from brain up to the liver of umbilicus in the abdomen so such a 
long and wanders so like a vagabond so it's called as a vagus now so every you know has got its name uh, and meaning in the name itself we'll come to the uh, each now later on some of them are pure sensory some of them are pure motor some of them are mixed so four of them are autonomic nervous system part of parasympathetic like oculomotor facial glossal pharyngeal vagus these four nerves are autonomic and they are always parasympathetic there is no sympathetic nerve in the cerebral nerves so all this information you have to understand right from its entry and exit from brain like first two brain come from the four brain third and fourth come from the middle brain then like fifth six seven eight they come from the pons 9 10 11 10 12 they come from the medulla oblongata either they come that means they either take a exit or they can enter because sensory nerves have to enter motor nerves have to exit <clears throat> This image shows you the different function of uh, different uh, cranial nerves. Okay, you can see olfactory for smell, optic for vision. You can see the third oculomotor nerve for the motor nerve supply, uh, supply of all the muscles as well as it is also autonomic for iris. So uh, for the oculomotion of light, the tip is having tip is present having three branches of motor uh, sorry sensory root, and there is also one motor root there, and you can see the supplying the face for. For the uh, says general sensations, seven is for facial muscles as well as for the glands because it's uh, autonomic now. Eight is for ear for vestibular cochlear, so both for um, balance and hearing, equilibrium and hearing. What we call ninth cranial nerve is a uh, sorry uh, ninth cranial nerve is a glossopharyngeal now. Glossopharyngeal now is for the tongue and uh, uh, pharynx. So, like uh, seventh cranial nerve gives a caudal tympani for the face sensation of anterior to third tongue. Glossopharyngeal is for the posterior one third part of uh, face sensation. So, they are also the state of Ten nerve is a vagus now. It is also autonomic. It is it's a mixed now. Eleventh is a motor uh, nerve for the two important muscles in the uh, in the pharynx and in the neck. And twelfth is a hypoglossal now, which is a uh, motor now to the muscles of the tongue so every detail we will get when we study a, a specific part of each uh, you know uh, role of each nerve there in the face now we'll go to the ventricular system so there are ventricles in the brain so though brain is a spherical organ though it is a solid organ it has still got a, a space deep inside interior and that is called as the ventricular system of brain it can it contains cerebrospinal fluid so there are four ventricles in the brain and they are lined by the ependymal cells which help to form the choroid plexus which forms cerebrospinal fluid so choroid plexus you know secretes or forms the cerebrospinal fluid so choroid plexus is a tuft of capillaries covered by ependymal cells there are two lateral ventricles so they are first and second and they are located in each of the hemispheres of cerebrum okay cerebral hemispheres we have two so there are two ventricles first and second so there is a third ventricle located in the ninth cerebrum. So altogether three ventricles are there in the fourth brain. Fourth ventricle is located in the hind brain, in between pons and cerebellum. So below the pons there is a medulla oblongata as well. So pons and medulla oblongata in front and cerebellum behind. So it's a part of hind brain, rhomben cerebrum. So these ventricles uh, contains the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord from inside out. So inside there is a ventricle system. So there is there are foramina to bring it out on the outer surface of the brain in the subarachnoid space. So from outside in the subarachnoid space and inside in the ventricles, this central this cerebrospinal fluid you know circulates all around. Here you can see the ventricles in a image of a full brain, a whole brain. The lateral uh, view, we can see these two lateral ventricles, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, and fourth ventricle. Same thing you can see here in the anterior posterior uh, view of uh, brain. You can see the anterior and posterior horn, you also can frontal and occipital horn, which is not occipital, temporal horn. Uh, here you can see fourth ventricle, which is mostly triangular. Well, here you can see third ventricle. So those ventricles, when they are brought outside the brain, they look somehow like this. So this is only ventricle system of a brain. Here you can see those ventricles nicely. These are the anterior horns, lateral horns, posterior horns. Okay, that 
and here you can see the interventricular foramen coming from lateral ventricle to third ventricle. So it is also called as foramen mundo. From third ventricle, CSA flows to the fourth ventricle via cerebral activity. That cerebral activity is present in the midbrain. And here you can see the triangular fourth ventricle, comparatively small. It's located in the hindbrain. And from there, CSA goes into the central canal of the spinal cord. Well, here you can see the different foramina of the ventricular system. This uh, interventricular foramina is also called as foramina mundo between lateral ventricle and uh, the third ventricle. So this is a cerebral activity that's here. But from here, we can see the foramina megendi and foramina lusca. So the, this uh, cerebral spinal fluid goes to the subarachnoid space here. And this central canal, which is called as central canal CSA going entering into the spinal cord. And, and my dear uh, students, we have finished uh, this uh, study of ventricles of the brain so ventricular system of the brain any ventricle can be a question to you in the exam including choroid plexus which forms the csf now what is csf csf is a tissue fluid so it replaces limb inside the head so in the brain you can see so there is no limb there inside the brain lymphatic system is present in the body but csf is present only in the brain it surrounds all exposed surfaces of brain in from inside also from outside also so brain and spinal cord so it is called as cns central nervous system csf cushions and supports and transports nutrients as well as whatever waste products okay and it interchanges with interstitial fluid fluid of brain like plasma or interstitial fluid elsewhere except much more pure so this csf is very pure because it is in the brain brain is the most vital organ of our body. Arachnoid villi protrude superiorly into dural sinuses and permit CSF to be absorbed in the venous blood. So you see that CSF is produced by the choroid plexus and choroid plexus are the tuft of capillaries or you can see the loop of capillaries uh, from coming from arteries. So, so that is uh, the structure which produces, forms the CSF and it comes into the ventricular system then it comes into the subarachnoid space. So in the subarachnoid space, it is the used CSF has to be drained back. So there has to be drainage. So arachnoid will I absorb that CSF from the, uh, from the subarachnoid spaces and they bring back to the dural sinuses. So dural sinuses are the venous sinuses. So in the venous sinuses, there is a return of CSF back for purification to go to heart. So this system, is uh, um, you know uh, present in the brain whereas uh, dural sinuses are uh, the venous drainage so there are no more veins in the brain because instead of veins there are venous sinuses there are less veins which are large veins we'll come to that point later on so this is the image of choroid plexus so choroid plexus forms csf that we have learned so far it's a nothing but cluster of capillaries. Okay? It's a cluster of capillaries lined by ependermal cell that forms uh, tissue fluid filters, which hang from the roof of each of the ventricles. So we have seen all the ventricles. So these choroid plexus are present in the ventricles. They have ion points that allow them to alter ion concentration of the CSF and help clean CSF by removing waste also. Okay, you can see in this image. And uh, this is the pathway of CSF flow. So from where CSF actually flows, starting from left, uh, sorry, lateral ventricles, these first two ventricles which are present in the cerebral hemispheres, from there through foramina mundro or interventricular foramina, it comes to third ventricle. From third ventricle via aqueduct of cervius or cerebral aqueduct, they come to fourth ventricle. From fourth ventricle via foramina of magenda and foramina of lushka they go to subarachnoid spaces of brain and spinal cord. So from here, it is going to the subarachnoid space, outer side of the brain. And from subarachnoid space, it is drained back by reabsorption into the venous sinuses, which are called as dural venous sinuses. So this is a good image. You can see the red color choroid plexus in the, at least you can see them in the lateral ventricle and fourth ventricle here. You can see the foramen and lushka and for a man again, so this is your sub arachnoid space where CSF is going back 
from C from subarachnoid space into the dural sinuses. The blue color is the dural sinus. There you can see the superior sagittal sinus. So we are going to study those subdural sinuses also. Prior to that, let us understand the scalp. Scalp is the covering of uh, your head. So scalp is a tough skin made up of almost six seven layers. You can see the layers of the scalp. Skin of the scalp. Then there is a periosteum. Then there is a skull bone. And here, <clears throat> this skin of the scalp has got further layers. And the bone of the skull is quite tough. It's a uh, more compact than spongy. So more compactness is there because brain requires more you know, protection. So below the skull bone, you can see the dura mater, first covering of the brain. Dura mater is always in two layers. So it is having double layer, periosteal layer and meningeal layer. So near meningeal layer, you'll find subarachnoid, subarachnoid, you know, layer of meninges. Below subarachnoid, there is a subarachnoid space where the CSF is present. And below subarachnoid space, there is a pia matter, which is fixedly attached to the surface of the cortex. You can see the gray matter here and white matter here. So uh, these three layers are called as meninges. One is called as menings. So dura matter consists of two layers, outer layer and inner layer. Outer layer is called as endosteal layer and inner layer is called as meningeal layer. In between the layers, you find these subdural sinuses. Subdural sinuses are intracranial venous sinuses. So instead of veins, we have got sinuses there for easy return of, easy and fast return of uh, what you call uh, used blood to the, back to the heart. And the arachnoid membrane covers the surface of brain and have a subarachnoid source. So the below, below arachnoid uh, membrane, there is a subarachnoid space which contains CSF. And so below there, there is a pia matter which is anchored or attached to the brain by astrocytes, wraps brain tightly like a saran wrap. So it is inseparable from brain surface. You can see the cranial meninges, <coughs> including skull. So there's a whole head, you know, you get square taken here. From here, you can see the cerebral cortex, pia matter, subarachnoid space containing the CSF. And then you can see a subdural space. Subdural space is below the dura matter. Then you can see above dura matter, you can see the, what do you call, in the folds of dura matter, you can see the dural venous sinuses. And uh, dura matter, endosteal layer which is at almost attached to the cranial bone that is skull bone subdural space is below the meningeal layer of dura mater. here you can see the scarf and periosteum and you can see the skull bone then you can see all these layers of meninges we'll come to another slide this is more clear you can see the pia matter arachnoid matter dura mater in two folds then there is a bone, then there is a periosteum, then there is aponeurosis, then there is a skin of skull, which is very tough. Here you can see the subdural sinus, where you can see the subarachnoid space where the CSC is drained back into the venous sinus. So all these things are, you know, quite easy to understand once you, uh, you know, the concept is clear. So the meninges uh, are actually three, but dura mater is in double layer. So two layers of fibrous connective tissue, fused they are actually though, though two layer they are fused except wherever there is a dural sinuses and the this this you know meningeal layer also gives the folds and those are four folds like fox cerebri fox cerebri tentorum cerebri and cella tarsica there are four folds arachnoid matter is just like a spider web okay it is loosely covered covering the brain the pia matter is fixedly attached to the brain which is inseparable once again I'll show you the dural folds. Here you can see the fax cerebral is a sickle in shape. So this is called as fold of dura matter. This is actually fold of meningeal layer of dura matter. It lies between the two hemispheres of cerebrum. Similarly, between the two hemispheres of cerebellum, there is a fax cerebelli. And above the fax, above the cerebellum and below the cerebrum, so there's a partition. It is made up of tentorium cerebelli because it forms a taint. And small fold of Dura matter is found in the hypophyseal fossa, okay, covering the pituitary gland. It's called as cella tarsica. There are four, 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 uh, four folds of periotinium, and all four folds of periotinium are shown here. You can see once again, this is a fox cerebri, biggest one, and then you can see another big one is tentorium cerebelli, 
Then there is a smaller inside of fox cerebelli, and here you can see diaphragmata cilia or cilia tarsica. Here you can see where there is a hypophyseal fossa. Location of pituitary gland. So fox cerebelli, fox cerebelli, they are tenderum cerebelli. Asked in exam sometimes folds of dura mater are asked in exams. So this can come in your exam. That is why it is uh, important for you. Well, here you can see those folds of dura mater enclosing the venous sinuses, which are called as dural sinuses. because they are present in the dura mater here you can see in in the fold of margins of fold of dura mater itself you'll get two venous sinuses superior sagittal sinus and inferior sagittal sinus if they are single in the median plane they are called as unpaired venous sinuses and if they are double they are called as paired venous sinuses if they are away from the median plane okay so likewise we get many of them but there are also few big large large veins also apart from sinuses but but mostly venous drainage is done by dural sinuses okay so interlayer spaces of meninges we have talked about we have touched this topic earlier but you can see in this slide separately epidural space ap means above dura mater so it is a potential space between dura mater and the skull bone subdural space is potential space between arachnoid mater and dura mater that means meningeal layer of arachnoid mater and sorry meningeal layer of dura mater and arachnoid mater subarachnoid space is between arachnoid mater and pia mater so this is very important because it contains collagen el elastic fiber network that spiders web like and it is filled with the cerebrospinal fluid where there are arachnoid villi and arachnoid granulations for reabsorption of csa back into the venous system so subdural subarachnoid space are frequent sites of intracranial bleeding so even due to head injury you get a bleeding and these are the sites where you get bleeding and hematoma in this slide you can see the csa flow through ventricles to subarachnoid space to dural sinus back to circulation so from arterial blood csa is produced it circulates inside and outside the brain and it is brought back to the venous blood this diagram we have seen earlier but now it is enlarged you can see very nicely the choroid plexus red in color pinky state which produces csa circulation of csa in the ventricles and then in the subarachnoid spaces and then back in the dural sinuses here you can see the reabsorption of uh, what you call csa from subarachnoid space space into the dural sinus so this is the arachnoid villi arachnoid granulations granulations now dural sinuses uh, are venous sinuses so they are for the venous drainage of the blood and there are many of them you can see the list here superior sagittal sinus cortical vein diploic vein now there are veins large veins also but veins are less and sinuses are more but we'll go to the sinuses like uh, see superior petrosal sinus spino parietal sinus and now here you can see the sigmoid sinus then you can see the straight sinus transverse sinus so those sinus which are present in the midline like uh, superior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus they are usually one <coughs> and like you know the sigmoid sinus transverse sinus they are two and there is a final confluence of sinuses where all together the venous blood is brought back to the uh, you know heart through internal jugular vein so you can see here this is the place where the internal jugular vein begins now we have studied this in the skull also internal jugular vein foramen for internal jugular vein okay and here you can see the sinus some of them you can see the cavernous sinus which is present around near the fifth uh, cranial nerve it looks like a cave so it like cavernous sinus apart from venous sinuses there there are uh, cisterns of uh, csa so there is a cisterna cisterna means pool of csa they are present in the subarachnoid spaces itself but they are like a pool so they are called as cisterns so cisterna pontis cisterna magna and so on here you can see all the venous sinuses the network of venous sinuses ultimately getting drained on both the sides to the internal jugular vein right and left side so blood is brought back through internal jugular vein from the vein as fast as possible because deoxygenated blood is no longer required for the brain because brain has to be kept very safe and brain has to be drained very fast that is why there are sinuses so sinuses do not have walls easily the blood flows due to gravity force pass and brain has got a tremendous brain has got a tremendous blood supply i'll come to the blood supply point after these venous sinuses you can see the venous sinuses again here 
you can see by coming ultimately to two of the internal jugular veins okay internal jugular vein on right side and left side and you can see the confluence of sinuses see from superior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus these are the two lateral sinuses which are called as transverse sinuses these are the sigmoid sinuses they are the same on each side cavernous sinuses pair okay now we'll go to the blood supply of the brain antero inferior arteries of the brain so from from below and from front actually you can see this view so from front side two arteries enter the skull and those are internal carotid arteries to through, through the carotid canal they enter and from behind through the foramen magnum two arteries enter these are the vertebral arteries they enter immediately uh, you get you know join to form a basilar artery so this is one basilar artery is formed by two two vertebral arteries now this basilar artery and this internal carotid arteries further they form a circle around the mid brain and this is called as circle of willis now we have to remember the branches uh, of these arteries where do they come from right from arch of avada to common carotid arteries or you can see left common carotid arteries then internal internal carotid artery external carotid artery so here we want only internal two internal carotid arteries in front and two vertebral arteries behind for the purpose of formation of circle of willis now this blood supplies duty and oxygen to the brain so it is delivered by internal carotid arteries and vertebral arteries which form circle of willis the circle of willis because willis discovered it and it is also called as circulus arteriosus because arteries are in the form of a circle there are removed from intracranial dural venous sinuses through internal jugular vein so that we have talked earlier so whatever used blood that is called as venous blood is removed from intracranial venous sinuses through the internal jugular vein that we have understood well now this is your circle of willis circle of willis you can see actual circle here these are the two internal carotid arteries and this is a basilar artery formed by two vertebral arteries and these are the other branches communicating branches and cerebral cerebral uh, branches what we call this is actual part of that circle of willis which looks like a circle so this is called a circulus arteriosus well and these are the branches of circulus arteriosus now we have also studied blood brain barrier during the time of uh, general neurology a dbb dbb isolates cns neural tissue from general circulation so general circulation of the body and brain there is a little difference as far as the protection is concerned brain requires more protection so there is a dbb blood brain barrier just like you know there is a barrier between mother and child during pregnancy in the placenta similarly brain is always has it the brain is a prime vital organ blood brain barrier is formed by network of tight junctions between endothelial cells of cns that is brain and spinal cord cns capillaries and by feet of astrocyte processes so astrocytes control blood brain barrier by releasing chemicals that control permeability of endothelium lipid soluble compounds o2 and co2 steroids and prostaglandins diffuse into interstitial brain uh, interstitial fluid of brain and spinal cord other things have to be transported so there are certain you know things which are allowed certain things which are not allowed entry towards brain to protect the brain that we have studied at length during general neurology but i'll still show you one diagram here this is normal blood vessel which is present in the body elsewhere but brain blood vessel is like this it has got a protection you can see the difference you can see this red color thing same here but additionally you can see glial brain cells support the barrier tight junction no pores create the barrier you can see well lined pore but here there are no pores you can see the pore passes you can you can't see pore passes here lipid soluble substances and carrier mediated transport are only allowed other things are not allowed in the brain okay and my dear friends my dear friends friends my dear students friends we have finished all the neuroanatomy today and we study anatomy because of this clinical importance we have to tomorrow deal with all this clinical uh, uh, you know what you call diseases 
So we have to understand about applied or meninges means inflammation of meninges, meningitis means inflammation of meninges, encephalitis means inflammation of brain, stroke, stroke means there's an infarction caused due to occlusion of the capillaries inside the brain and there is a uh, hemiplegia, paralysis, paresis means all types of different paralysis, motor functions are damaged, neuralgia, pain along the nerves, hydrocephalus, excess of CSF in the head, Parkinsonism, ataxia. So ataxia is a cerebellar disease, Parkinsonism is a cerebral disease. We have studied all these parts in anatomy. We don't have to remember the diseases because it will be covered during practice of medicine in your clinical years. And with this, my dear friend, I'll show you the final image here of Broadman's areas. You have to remember all these Broadman's areas because uh, they are specifically important as far as the, the prime ones are considered, like area number four is located on the precentral gyrus. It's called a motor area for the cross movement. Area number six is on the pre-motor area for the skillful movements. Area number eight is for the frontal eye field movements. Area number 44, 45 are the Broca's area called a motor speech area. Area number 41, 42 are the primary auditory area and 20, 21, 22 are the secondary auditory area. Area number 28 and 39 are for the uh, olfactory area. Area number 43 located at gustatory area. Area number 312 are primary sensory area. Area 5, 7 is secondary sensory area. Area number 17 is primary visual area. Area 18, 19 is secondary visual area. So at least these prominent areas you should know. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult tomorrow to remember the whole brain. And uh, with this, my dear friends, we have finished today's webinar. And uh, we'll go to the last part of uh, today's webinar. Just wait. Correct. Okay. So in all, uh, we have uh, completed the whole neuroanatomy. And with this, uh, let us end our today's program with another few slides of uh, just general knowledge. Hope you remember everything as far as the uh, anatomy of brain and spinal cord is concerned. Here you can see the whole brain, uh, uh, functioning brain. So this is a dynamic thing. And I can't control the class because we are online studying control your behavior during online classes. This is what I actually say, but uh, we are at distant places. So this is what students uh, say, what are you going to do? Send me home because you're already at home. So this is a joke. And uh, yeah, there's a moment when I received best teacher out from Mimichas Nasik. Have a nice day. And the end of today's program as well as end of the study of anatomy of brain, spinal cord and related part. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Once again, have a nice day. And now we'll proceed further with the study of special sense organs from tomorrow onwards. Thank you.